Welcome to Rock, Paper, Hand, Grenades with your co-hosts. Oh, wait. Wait. There's a conspicuously empty non-chair sitting next to me. That's because Gary Hopper, the familiar face that you know and love, is taking a break today. He's got some things to do. And of course, he entrust, dubiously entrusted uh, anchoring the show to his fledgling co-host, Eric Eastman. So <laughs> here I am with a particularly, particularly distinguished guest that I'm extremely happy to uh, have on the air and to have a chance to talk with for an entire hour yeah. <laughs> in, in front of the city of Manchester. This is Elizabeth Rob, oh, hi everyone. welcome to Rock, Paper, Hand Grenades. And uh, I understand that we're going to be talking about, of course, a uh, big part of it is your profession mm -hmm. as an acupuncturist, mm -hmm. as well as the way that uh, the city itself and the business community is behaving towards uh, the use of acupuncture and some of the initiatives you're mm -hmm. looking to, to push forward mm -hmm. uh, in terms of treatment using acupuncture, particularly for those that are... Uh, are uh, suffering from the from the uh, grip of addiction. Mm -hmm. I understand that that's something in which you specialize. So I'm excited to hear about it. So welcome. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Tell it's us been a about while. yourself a little bit. Um, it's been a little while since I've been on rock paper hand grenades. Um, actually, the last time I was here, um, Gary Hopper was helping me navigate a, a legislative meltdown. <laughs> um, okay. Because we were, I was working on. Um, trying to get a bill passed through the legislature or I wasn't passing it legislators were passing it but um, it got amended at the last minute on the Senate floor and it was a terrible amendment it would have wrecked our our bill our bill was it, our bill which ultimately passed without the amendment right. um, is to allow people who aren't acupuncturists people who work in the field of substance misuse disorder behavioral health and mental health mm -hmm. to practice a specific acupuncture treatment it's just five points in the ear and it started in as a go ahead <laughs> no 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 that's I mean this is something people need to know about so I'm glad you're bringing it up mm -hmm. and that this is making it w its way out into mm -hmm. the general public because mm -hmm. people may not understand mm -hmm. the breadth of applications that acupuncture has right. in terms of therapeutic treatment and this crisis is upon us it's a big deal yeah and it's not happening now, it's happening yesterday and yesteryear. And um, so when our, when, our bill, when our bill ultimately passed and was signed into law, it, we ended up with a really good law. But it could, have been, it could have been wrecked. And when it was in, the, in sort of the throes of nearly being wrecked, I was here on the show having a meltdown. <laughs> <laughs> and Gary was actually really helpful in communicating with the senator who unknowingly was putting restrictions around it. I see. Interesting. Right. Yeah. Uh, well, he's a veteran legislator. Mm -hmm. he's, he's, a, he's a friend of the citizens of New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. um, I've enjoyed working with him immensely in this last calendar year mm -hmm. on this show, and I mm -hmm. hope to continue to do to do that. As you know, I served in the legislature for a couple of years. Yeah, actually, you were one of the people I was going to approach about being a sponsor, but then I Jan Schmidt it. won, and Jan Schmidt became a sponsor. Interestingly, mm -hmm. Jan Schmidt mm -hmm. uh, uh, and I were competitors because mm -hmm. we were in different parties, even though many of our, our social views do mm -hmm. overlap right um, I as a libertarian leaning kind of person mm -hmm. uh, embrace a lot of things that she does and mm -hmm. that you do too and, mm -hmm. and so I'm proud to hear that my state representative mm -hmm. co-sponsored that bill she did yeah yeah, yeah. so, so good really on helpful. her yeah, right. and so now at this point, uh, well, at this point for many, many months, we've been working through the rules process. Mm -hmm. So everyone keeps asking me, how's it going? Is everyone practicing ear acupuncture and treatment facilities now here in New Hampshire? And I can say no, because there's this long process of writing rules for laws once they get passed. That's true. And that, f that regulatory process falls into the hands of which agency? The Board of Acupuncture Licensing. Okay. The main opposition of our law. Why is that? So this particular, so for decades now, um, acupuncture licensing boards have fought off laws like this one mm -hmm. with this idea in mind that if no one other than acupuncturists can practice acupuncture, then all of the work doing acupuncture will go to the acupuncturist. It's a catch-22 because ultimately what that means is that very few people will know what acupuncture is and what it's for and what it treats. They won't necessarily know many people who get acupuncture and therefore it's just going to remain this very sort of fringe esoteric thing. Right. So um, 
when a law was passed in 1997, which was the original Acupuncture Practice Act, many people who worked to get that law passed made a particular effort to make sure that there wasn't a provision in the law that allowed for ear acupuncture to be practiced by recovery workers, other allied, other allied health professionals for the, for the use of substance misuse disorder or mental health or behavioral health. What would you attribute that gesture on their part to? Um, it's ultimately a self-serving nature. Is, and it, is it a turf war? It's a turf war. It's exactly a turf war. Okay. So here's the thing. I'm an acupuncturist. I know that there are very few jobs in this country for acupuncturists. It does, in fact, suck. However, putting... <laughs> we can say that on TV. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> However, if we look at other states where there are either no laws that allow for anyone else to practice ear acupuncture in any kind of mental health setting, any kind of recovery setting, right. it doesn't mean that jobs for acupuncturists get created. There are very... F so the state of California doesn't have a law, doesn't have an ADS law either, a law that allows for the certification of acupuncture detoxification specialists. I see. There are some recovery programs in California that do hire acupuncturists, but that's California. Um, there's a lot less acupuncturists working in recovery centers in California than there were, say, back in the 80s or 90s. We had something called a recession. There's not a lot of public, there was never a lot of money in public health. Now there's even right. less money in public health. Right. Even with an opioid crisis, there's still not a lot of money in public health for some reason. It strikes me, it strikes me as odd that there's a downtick in, uh, or downturn in, um, in practice, availability of and, and uh, practicing acupuncturists mm -hmm. in the state of California, right. a place where one would normally mm -hmm. consider alternative treatments to be fairly popular. There's a lot of acupuncturists in California. We don't necessarily know how many of them have active licenses, just like anywhere else in the country. I see. Um, and again, many work part time. Many, some work full time. Some might have some work working in a d rehab facility, but not very many. Not as many as there used to be. Sure. Massachusetts used to have more jobs available for acupuncturists to be doing ear acupuncture in treatment facilities. But again, we had something called the recession in two thousand and seven. So a lot of those public health jobs went away. Okay, so it was primarily the public health sector, right. which related to public funding somehow, right. in, in, right. depending on the state, right. um, and that's what suffered. Right, exactly. Oregon, um, again, so no one other than acupuncturists can practice acupuncture in Oregon, not even physical therapists, which is common in many states, like New Hampshire. Physical therapists practice a form of acupuncture called dry needling. It's just, in acupuncture, we refer to it as a sure needling, or needling exactly where the pain in the muscle is. Okay. It's just another form of acupuncture. Different I, technique. Different technique. Um, right. As a community acupuncturist, meaning I work in a setting where that's high volume, it's low cost. I meet people all the time who have gotten acupuncture from a chiropractor or a PT. They've had dry needling and they still come in and get affordable community acupuncture. So from my standpoint, I don't think it's a problem that PTs and chiropractors practice dry acupuncture, um, practice the dry needling. So the theory, st statistically, mm -hmm. it, the theory that this practice somehow eclipses opportunities mm -hmm. for acupuncturists doesn't bear itself out. I think the, it's a false one. The numbers don't support that claim. Right. I think so. I mean, there's more PTs in this country than there are acupuncturists. Right. There's entire areas of the country, like the Midwest, where chiropractors and PTs are just there in numbers where there aren't acupuncturists. So if, if you're in the state of Kansas and you need acupuncture, it's going to be hard to find an acupuncturist. You're more likely to find a chiropractor or a physical therapist if you need acupuncture. Okay. Who can? Who can and provide who, and, and do provide some acupuncture. Great. And yeah. licensing mm -hmm. requirements and boundaries vary from state to state? They do. Correct? They do. Okay. So what, again, what, yeah. What, what, what are the states... What would you say are the flagship states that are embracing this ethos of allowing people that aren't necessarily exclusively acupuncturists mm -hmm. practice this important craft? So or the of state of Connecticut has had an Accu Detox law for a really long time, and uh -huh. it was expanded in the last few years. So in Connecticut, it's been used. Your acupuncture has been used by. Um, nurses and other health professionals for the use of substance misuse disorder and for a long time it could only be practiced in 
um, programs. But in the last few years, their law expanded. And so, so that way, people who had long time been practicing ear acupuncture in, within programs could also offer ear acupuncture in sort of like a, a private room counseling setting. You know, okay. veterans of, you know, basically veteran practitioners like nurse, nurse psychologists. Sure. And, and um, people that had pursued professional continuing education in right. order to expand what they could offer. Right. Ear acupuncture is a certification. It is, it is continuing education for many people who are already in an established health field. It sounds like it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it doesn't sound like you have to understand all the meridians of the entire nervous system. You need to know five points, and that's uh -huh. it. And again, so what's what really boggles my mind for a long time, or all last year actually, it was I was banging my head against the wall, arguing with other acupuncturists in the state of New Hampshire, saying, why don't you understand where ear acupuncture comes from? It was developed in the 1970s in the midst of a heroin epidemic by the Black Panther Party. That's fat. You've told me this before in an ad hoc conversation. Right. And that stayed with me, and I've been pondering that. And I've been banging my head against the wall thinking, why don't they know that? And then I realized, wait, nobody told me this when I was in acupuncture school. The reason why I know is because I'm interested in knowing that, and so are many of my community acupuncture colleagues. It's it's a fascinating truth. Yes, a piece of American history. Yes, and um, I mean it begs a lot of questions as to why it is the Black Panthers were so savvy about this particular treatment methodology well, that they adopted it and pursued it. Well, they were surrounded by the epidemic affecting their community. That's and, true. And many of them themselves were struggling with trying to get off methadone. That's true. So they needed to come up with something, and a lot of different things were happening at, at that time. I mean, Richard Nixon went to China, and that opened up new interest in Chinese culture. Um, there was a really interesting story that came out of China. There was a guy who went to a hospital. People thought he was sick. They were prepping him for surgery, so they gave him ear acupuncture, thinking that would help prep him for surgery. And it, it turned out that all of his symptoms that they were going to provide the surgery for were reduced with the ear acupuncture because they realized that he was suffering from withdrawal from opium. And that story made it from somewhere in China, a hospital in China, to the South Bronx. What professionalism on the part of that Chinese medical staff to catch that change in this person's symptoms that mm -hmm. they exhibited and to stop the surgery from going forward? Right. They must have had minutes to make that assessment. Right. And then the news got out. Yeah. And now we know. And that's so, and it's just so random. That's but that's how it started. It started in the South Bronx. Well, acupuncture was practiced by Black Panther parties on both the East Coast and the West Coast. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, let me devil's advocate for a minute. It can't mm -hmm. just have been the Black Panthers. That of course were, not. That were of course, conscious of the, the value mm -hmm. of this ancient practice. Mm -hmm. um, they just, because uh, socioeconomically in many ways, they and their communities, mm -hmm. of which they were primarily concerned, we're catching the brunt mm -hmm. of this social problem the in this opioid war. crisis, mm -hmm. the drug war, yeah. Mm -hmm. So the results of that meant that they had to innovate mm -hmm. and they had to look after their own. Right, right. Am I correct? Correct. I mean, acupuncture has been practiced in this country for at least 100 years by immigrants from other countries. Yeah, we've had a lot of Chinese immigration. So the, the way the West was, was won in part was on the backs of a lot of people that were indentured in, in indentured servitude right. or something like it. Mm -hmm all from the East. But the, the practice of ear acupuncture for addiction, I like to think of as a very American innovation. Huh. Because worldwide, really, the Bronx was the epicenter. The, of the Bronx practice. was the epicenter. And so even though we learned about ear acupuncture helping one person in a Chinese hospital recover from the effects of opium withdrawal, that information was really sort of studied and sort of, um, um, I would say, like incubated in, um, in the South Bronx. And it, was, it became part of a longtime recovery program through the, Lincoln, um, through the Lincoln Hospital and the Lincoln Detox Center. It ran from 1974 to 2011 <laughs> under Dr. Mike Smith, who unfortunately passed away on, on December 24th of this year. I see. Okay. And his whole mission, actually, so he mentored Marty Bolden, who is a policy advisor to Governor Sununu currently. 
but he so wow. dr mike smith mentored marty bolden in the 1980s in chicago so when i had a chance to talk to marty bolden hey i got this law passed i need your help what do i do now you know i don't know what i'm doing just help you know worked on sure. getting this thing going what do i do you have the governor's ear yeah help me out. and then he said so do you know mike smith and then i said um yeah that's why we're here actually the expert on this bill laura cooley she lives in orford new hampshire mm -hmm. she was mentored by dr mike smith for a long time and traveled the country with him and worked on legislative changes in Louisiana and in Texas and in Missouri and so they you know so she and I are talking to Marty and they're having this whole conversation about how they both have known Dr. Mike Smith at different times in their lives this movement can't lose steam and it seems to me that this movement can't lose steam because I mean it's such a vital treatment mm -hmm. at a time when we're experiencing such trouble with opiates. Mm -hmm. Why? What would be the what would be the impediments to this stopping being a fringe, treated as if it's a fringe right. treatment, or receiving opposition from people that are protecting their turf? Right. You know, w within the acupuncture community. And I don't want to demonize those folks. I'm sure they feel they have their reasons and all that. Right. But uh, what are the impediments, and what can we do about it? Well, I'm. We're still working on rules, and so there's going to be another meeting this Friday morning. Would you like to join me at a meeting on Friday morning with the Board of Acupuncture Licensing? Could happen. Um, 10 o'clock at, what is it, 141 South Fruit Street, 121 South Fruit Street. Okay. Um, it's, I think this is going to be one of the final meetings before we start talking about public hearings. And, and I don't even know what the process is. How many meetings do we have? And then is it a public hearing just for the public to weigh in and then we go to Jelcar? I don't know. So Jelcar is the next stop for this. Isn't yeah. That, so, that, and like, okay. and so um, I would say this, I've been attending their board meetings for the last six months. They've been happening once a month, uh, once every two months. Right. We've watched them go through several drafts of rules. We've been catching hangups along the way. There were a lot of random made up regulations that the board was trying to put around the rules and Laura and I kept giving them feedback. What do you think would have been motivating the board to do that? Control. Just flat out control. Okay. I mean, I will say this. I'll give them credit. They did have a conference call with the executive director of the National Acupuncture Detoxification Association. But okay. you think that they would trust her. She works for this organization that's been in existence since the 80s. It was founded by Dr. Mike Smith, who ran the longest, you know, the, one of the original treatment programs for ear acupuncture. And okay. still s several board members, I would say half the board seemed really upset, dissatisfied, grumbled by the feedback that she was giving them. And again, it's because I, they I don't find this yeah. shocking. I yeah. mean, <laughs> you know, people in all sectors of government uh, from the top down, mm -hmm. uh, certainly in the legislature when I was mm -hmm. there, and that was, you know, uh, over the last three years, mm -hmm. have been touting their concern. Right. their stated concern, their professed concern for the way that our, our uh, communities are afflicted mm -hmm. by this crisis and by the influx of this, of this poison. So why on earth would, other than control, right. unless that's it? It's really just control because... Would they do that or, or have such skepticism, especially on a conference call with somebody that's such a seasoned expert, expert who yeah. really does know what they're talking about, right. uh, about what's happening on the street? Right. I mean, ultimately, I would say someone who has in the past acted as almost my arch nemesis on the licensing board. It's almost everything I say. She wants to challenge me and claim fake news. Um, she reached out to the president of the National Acupuncture Detoxification Association. Okay. The president of NADA is is a <laughs> PhD psychologist by the name of Dr. Libby Stout. She runs a 90-day um, detox facility in Pueblo, Colorado. It's medication-assisted plus ear acupuncture. She's been doing this for a long time. She's written several scholarly papers. She's been the president of NADA for some years. Sure. And so said board member finally emails her after you know we go through this entire process of hearings and amendments and removing amendments and committee of conference and being on New Hampshire Public Radio and WMUR. And I keep telling her all along, if you don't believe me, if you don't trust me call these people at this organization who do this you know at least talk to them I don't care if you don't believe me but at least listen to them 
finally she reaches out to the president and says, Dr. Libby, you're the voice of reason. Take a look at this law. Surely you couldn't approve of such a flexible law. Did she ask a loaded question? Yes. Sounds like it. <laughs> so Dr. Libby Stout, the president of NADA, takes a look at the New Hampshire law and she says, this is one of the best laws I have ever seen of its kind, and I'm really proud of New Hampshire legislators for passing it. Then what happened? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Like, I'll find out on Friday. Is this on record? The fact that she gave that response, and she's the president. She would have sent this in an email. So she would have sent this in an email to that board member. I don't have a copy of it. I just know this because I happened to be in Colorado two weeks ago, and I had dinner with Dr. Libby Stout, who told me this herself. Reaching out to Dr. Libby Stout and, and getting her to forward a copy of that email to you might be a great strategic move. That's a great idea. That's a really, really fantastic Sounds to idea. Me like you have a rapport and that she's on your side on this discussion mm -hmm. and that there's just some people whose views of the nature of acupuncture mm -hmm. are, st are stuck in mm -hmm. uh, a reality that, uh, or an alternate reality. Right. And I, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to cast aspersions mm -hmm. on people that hold an opposite view about mm -hmm. this matter. But Clearly, they're concerned about public health, too, mm -hmm. but apparently they're, they're concerned about process as much, at least, as they are about getting the help out there and making it available. Right. I mean, and here's the thing about Colorado. Dr. Libby herself was pushing a legislative effort through, um, in Colorado to get an ADS law. It took her three sessions and a paid lobbyist to get a law that's not as flexible as the law we have here in New Hampshire. She would have wanted, she wants a law like what we have in New Hampshire. What she has is um, a law that allows nurses and only licensed prof health professionals to practice ear acupuncture and only within programs. But mm -hmm. it can be used for substance misuse disorder and mental health and behavioral health. Whereas in New Hampshire, there's more flexibility. It's certified and licensed professionals. Because not everyone who works in a health profession is licensed, but they might have a certification mm -hmm. and it doesn't have to be restricted within say the walls of a program people I can see. travel move around because I mean we're talking about a major epidemic if you want to do any kind of street outreach that should be allowed well I tend to agree I mean the, mm -hmm. the way you're presenting it strikes me as being a remarkably grounded and reasoned mm -hmm. uh, presentation of the facts mm -hmm. based mm -hmm. on the uh, efficacy obscure word mm -hmm. the usefulness right. of this mm -hmm. of this treatment modality and you know it's an all hands on deck issue right yes. now isn't it i mean i volunteer at hope for new hampshire recovery here in manchester but that's one morning a week so i might volunteer and treat up to 10 to 12 people in a morning but they're more further along in the recovery process i'm doing it to help people with anxiety underlying stress we want to prevent any kind of relapse because you know a lot of people are relapsing. That's kind of, you know, that's how people are dying. They, they're in recovery, they're doing well, something happens, you relapse. There needs to be all, you know, all tools available to prevent that. That's part of the reality of the treatment arc yeah. that we have to address. Right. Hey, we've got an incoming call. Oh, okay, great. So I'm gonna bring it on. We've got uh, Norm calling in. Welcome to the show, Norm. Thanks for calling in. Hello? Yes, Norm. This is Eric Eastman, hey. Gary Hopper's co-host. Yeah. Welcome to the yeah. show. Hey, uh, Norm, I was, hey, to the lady that I got to tell you, the acupuncture is the only way to fly. I've had a lot of pains in my back and in my legs, but I went to an acupuncture man. I felt like a million dollars afterwards. And it's also cured a lot of my appetite. So. Keep up the good work and go all the way with acupuncture. Oh, Excellent. Thank you. Excellent. And that's another thing he talked about. Thank you, Norm, for calling in. That's great. He's the co-host of the show that, that immediately precedes ours, so that's nice of him to call in. Yeah, that's great. Thanks for your call, Norm. I was just going to say acupuncture for pain. So many people are talking about the fact that we might be in this crisis partly but not completely due to the fact that so many doctors are writing scripts for opioid pain medication. I mean, this is even happening in the military. Many people in the military are struggling with addiction because they're given a lot of opioid pain medication. Really, we need regular availability of acupuncture for pain management as a first step before you necessarily need to go for opioids or for surgery. But not a lot of insurance covers acupuncture. Medicaid doesn't cover acupuncture. Medicare doesn't cover acupuncture, except now in Ohio, Governor Kasich signed a 
bill into law that was passed by Ohio legislators that allows Medicaid coverage for acupuncture. No and kidding. Oregon did the same thing. No kidding. Right. Well, those bills had to make it to their desks. So yeah. obviously the legislature's on the ball. And right. Yeah. What's happening on the streets. And I'm wondering, I wonder, could that happen here in New Hampshire? Why? would certainly be a part of that legislative push if it were. That would be great. <laughs> I'm speaking theoretically. <laughs> the thing is that, and this is something that during my brief experience in the legislature from 14 to 16, what I did learn, having gone to a couple of conferences, is that you got to keep your ear to the ground as mm -hmm. far as what's happening elsewhere in the country. Mm -hmm. If you take the awesome responsibility mm -hmm. and investment of trust that mm -hmm. your neighbors have placed in you yeah. to go make the laws mm -hmm. or unmake the laws as mm -hmm. the case may be uh, that govern us all mm -hmm. you need to know what's working out there and what isn't which means you've got to go get the facts mm -hmm. get the data and sometimes staying insular and within your own state isn't enough right. and you really need to pay attention you've cited statistics about what's happening in other states and uh, it seems to me that they're duplicatable right so it, it seems like <laughs> I, it strikes me as a no-brainer, so obviously you, That's you're, what you're many preaching to a friendly saying. audience. Yeah, exactly. But for those that are more skeptical, for those that are more perhaps establishmentarian in their thinking mm -hmm. in terms of the way mm -hmm. that the acupuncture community at large mm -hmm. is wishing to do things, what would you say to them? Again, I would say, well, there are the people who say, nah, this probably won't work, and you're putting out false hope. I'll say, well, for, first of all, no one th health modality is going to help everybody. Right. You know, there are plenty of people who get surgery for pain and it doesn't work, or they take medication for pain and it doesn't work, right. or they might try different paths to recovery and they don't work. This is just one extra tool. But we do have data out of drug court programs in Miami-Dade, California, very, very successful. No kidding. Very successful. It's been happening since the 80s. So a lot of drug court judges, and I know that the drug court pheno phenomenon has had mm -hmm. pretty favorable results yeah. around the country, um, are aware of this? Some, yeah. As a as an important step. Mm -hmm. And some people will say, well, um, actually it was Marty Bolden who actually said he's read everything there is to read about acupuncture for addiction and the results are still inconclusive. But really we need better studies. You know, not that many people are willing to fund acupuncture studies. So we need more of that. But if you have a flexible law like we do in, in here in New Hampshire, we can gather data. And that law was signed. And that law was signed. And are there people as far as you know, who are in lawmaking, who continue to take issue with it? Um, not that I'm aware of. I think on a Facebook page, there was a representative who posted some article from Snope saying, this is inconclusive. And I'm like, well, you know, come to where I work sometime or come to Hope for New Hampshire Recovery and get ear acupuncture with other people getting ear acupuncture. And then you tell me how you feel. Yeah, I doubt the, I doubt that Snopes maybe is necessarily on top of New Hampshire-based data. Right. You know, I mean, it's a or just any data on your acupuncture. Uh, possibly, right. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah, and I guess the other thing is there are some people would say, well, shouldn't this be up to the Board of Acupuncture Licensing? Well, historically, we look at other states and we see how any board of licensing is going to play a turf battle with other boards. I mean, it's just how it goes. When I explain this to people and I say, yeah, our opposition was the board of acupuncture licensing, they say, oh, of course. And they don't even have to know anything about acupuncture. But this is basically what has happened. Like the, the one of the biggest obstacles to getting ear acupuncture into recovery programs and to easily get it to people who need it for post-disaster stress, they tend to be the professional associations for acupuncture and the boards of acupuncture licensing. It's this fear that jobs that they currently don't have will ultimately never exist for them, but they're not going to exist anyway if people don't accept acupuncture. People don't know that they need acupuncture until they get acupuncture. Look what happened with the popularity arc of chiropractic mm -hmm. care. And I don't know that story extremely well, but I know enough to know that there was a lot of pushback from the established medical community, the Western medical community, for many years, many mm -hmm. decades. Mm -hmm. And chiropractic is considered pretty mainstream nowadays, mm -hmm. and most insurances do address it. And there are a it. lot of chiropractors in New Hampshire. Yeah. 
Yeah. <laughs> and I know after the hearing, I had really bad back pain. I didn't know why. And I found out I had dislocated ribs. And while acupuncture was keeping me functioning, it wasn't until my friend Jessica, a chiropractor in Londonderry, was able to help me with my dislocated ribs. Ooh, that doesn't yeah. sound like fun. <laughs> yeah, I know. I was testifying <laughs> with back pain, not realizing I had dislocated ribs. Uh, yeah. And so, but that, you know, mm -hmm. that's further mm -hmm. testament to the fact that. Mm -hmm. You know, look, as we learn more as a society right. we, and we and we uh, put our egos aside and allow ourselves to be teachable, right. um, things improve right. because we embrace we embrace other modalities. And, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, there's a lot of other things that are referred to as or looked at by the establishment mm -hmm. as being fringe treatments. Right. Um, even psychiatry had its mm -hmm. had its rocky start right. and psychology. But now. The court system has fully embraced the role of psychologists mm -hmm. in terms of many of their, their sentencing and mm -hmm. judgments and, mm -hmm. and, and what have you. So I work at an affordable acupuncture clinic here in Manchester, and we have another location in Nashua. And I mm -hmm. would say that because we make the acupuncture affordable, more people get acupuncture. They tell their doctors that they're getting acupuncture. Their doctors physically see that their patients are doing better living and living better that they don't hesitate now to tell other patients to go ahead and try acupuncture right whereas i've been practicing acupuncture in the state of new hampshire for almost eight years so i moved here in 2010 um it was my third year onto my job that people said my doctor told me to try acupuncture but it was a year or two after that that everyone just started saying my doctor told me to come here you know to manchester acupuncture studio yeah. so when it's affordable and people have access to it then they can show their doctors they're doing well with acupuncture. Whereas sure. the conventional way of thinking for acupuncturists and acupuncture associations and acupuncture schools is if we look more like doctors and if we sound more like doctors, doctors will respect us and they'll send us their patients. No. Doc and, and, you know. and if we bill like doctors. And if we bill like doctors. Uh -huh. And I don't know. I mean, if not all acupuncturists want to practice in a low cost, high volume setting. I happen to love it and find it really liberating. Right. Other people want to just treat one or two patients at a time and add in all the extra modalities that we learn in school that are wonderful but time consuming. And sure. oftentimes, you know, you can debate whether or not they're necessary. Um, but I, you know, I find that if you just give people a lot of acupuncture, they'll just that's really all they need. They don't necessarily need all this extra stuff. But for the people who want to practice in a slower setting, billing insurance could be a really great thing for them. And I have nothing against insurance parity. If that helps someone running a private practice build up their practice, that's really great. It's just that they might do really well treating 20 patients a week and living really well. But what if they live in a town that has a few thousand or a few hundred people? Okay. They can't all go there and be served by that one practitioner. True. True enough. So it's, I mean, no one's arguing that this is a replacement for massage or mm -hmm. chiropractic or, right. or Reiki or, you know, right. anything. Or surgery. <laughs> or surgery, yeah. you know, and, and or keeping he helping of pharmaceuticals. Mm -hmm. I mean, everything's got its place. Mm -hmm. Science continues to evolve. Right. We, we continue. And, and it's funny because people think of science as being, you know, cutting edge, bleeding edge, new uh, developments, and most of that is in biotech. Mm -hmm. But... We're looking backwards too for mm -hmm. some answers. And right. Acupuncture is a part of that. Yep. You know, in human history, it's d been demonstrated to be extremely useful. We've got another caller. Oh. Guess who it is? Gary Hopper. Gary Hopper. My long lost co host. Welcome to the show. Thanks for calling in, sir. Hi, how are you guys doing? Doing okay. Doing okay. You watching the show? Yeah. Yeah, I'm watching it on my uh, tablet while you guys are uh, talking. But great. The real question, if I had, if I was there tonight, the one big question I wanted to know was: Elizabeth uh, posted on Facebook last Sunday that she was running for Congress. I just thought that was pretty cool. So I'd like I'd like to you know, ask her about that, and then I'll take my paper off the air. Wow, you've outed Elizabeth on your very own show without even being here, Gary. You're a magic man. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks. I'm dying. I'll see you guys later. Thanks Bye. for calling us and causing Elizabeth to blush. Now that she's on the spot, we're going to look into that. That was my April Fool's joke. 
Oh, and Easter joke, too. Yeah, it was my April Fool's Easter <laughs> joke. Well, so many people are running for Congress in Congressional District it, 1. It seems like they are. And I kept thinking, I should just run, too, and I'll make my formal announcement on April Fool's Day. Perfect. Only I, instead of announcing that I was running in CD1, I thought it'd be funnier to say that I was running in CD2 since I don't live in congestion in the second congressional district. Even better. It's an even better joke. Yeah. And then everyone thought, well, not everyone, a few people thought I was serious. Well, it, it, the news made its way, obviously, all the way to a major media anchor yeah. named Gary, Gary Hopper. Gary Hopper. Yeah. Who? Yeah, he said, come on my show tonight and we'll talk about your running for Congress. And I was like, that was an April Fool's Day joke, Gary. <laughs> okay, so that begs the question, what would it take, Elizabeth Ropp, acupuncturist and, and friend of the people of New Hampshire, and, and lobbyist and activist as well, yep. and very faithfully so. I've seen you up at the State House lots of times. Yeah. And, uh, mm -hmm. and, and your other half, too. He's, mm -hmm. he's extremely active and... Uh, um, another bearded Eric. Another bearded Eric. See how that works. Mm -hmm. Um, what would it take ultimately to be goaded into p considering a congressional run? I think anyone to, who'd run for Congress is kind of crazy. <laughs> you have to prepare yourself for sitting in a cubicle with a Rolodex calling people who will fund your next for campaign. Money. Yeah, yeah I know. It's insane. Yes. 50% of the time. Yeah. You and there are people who are running who I have a lot of respect for. And I keep thinking, why, when you can stay local and you can probably do the most good? Do more good, yeah. Why do you want a job in Washington as a telemarketer? Right. Uh, I, I, sorry, congressional delegation from yeah. New Hampshire. We love you. Right. We, we yeah. appreciate the hard work that you do, and we know that you do it. Right. But, but there's a reason why you don't call us. We don't have much money to give you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> good. Well, I'm glad we've cleared that up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I can think of uh, I can think of a few people who would do who would bring more integrity to the job. I will tell you that uh, than me, than, <laughs> than yourself. <laughs> so you know, for what that's worth, of asking for money or of running for Congress. No, running running for Congress and doing the other stuff that yeah. you could do and do well. Mm. But uh, we're glad to have you stay here in New Hampshire and help our state get better. Um, okay, so. We've talked about the virtues mm -hmm. of the tr of the treatment of this particular modality. Is mm -hmm. it? Am I using the right terminology? Yeah. The modality. Yeah. Okay. Um, and the fact that ear acupuncture, in particular, mm -hmm. speaks to um, speaks to addiction and, and recovery. Yeah. That's an interesting fact. Why the ears? That's a really good question. What's going on? I mean, I would say, honestly, I really don't know. There's a lot about acupuncture that I don't understand, and I do anywhere from 80 to 120 treatments a week. Okay. There's something about the points in the year specifically that are really helpful for acute stages of, of, of detox mm -hmm. from any substance. Um, so early on... I would say back last spring, my friend Ryan Fowler was working over on Central Street in what was a respite center, and I don't think it is anymore. Mm -hmm. And he said, just come on over and do treatments. And I said, well, we don't have anyone's permission of who actually runs this place, so I'm going to teach everyone how to do ear acupressure. So with just little seeds or little beads on tape, we did the same five points, but with seeds instead of needles. And I honestly didn't think that it would do much of anything, but I wanted to offer something that I knew wouldn't hurt. And we saw a lot of people who were suffering from body aches, headaches, nausea, fatigue, suddenly start to feel a little bit better. And everyone would say that they were sleeping better when they got that treatment. And I was just showing up once a week on a, on a Thursday after my shift just you know to do that one treatment per week and, you, you know. and, you and I mean again I did it just that's when I could show up I was telling everyone who worked there do this for everybody every day but they didn't always have time so again that's okay. another that's another sort of um, impediment to to getting this into the community at large okay. is you know first of all getting people trained but also having the people who are trained having the time within everything else they have to do with their jobs is the training and certification uh, in compliance with this new law mm -hmm. burdensome for a health practitioner who just wants to be able to do this one thing it's a 70 hour competency based course okay if you can do it competently then you can get your certificate 70 hours yep a lot less hours than you'd invest in for example a a full That's acupuncture a degree. Full acupuncture degree or, right. or even an associate's degree. Right, exactly. You know, I mean, but one, there, one year, 70 hours, you mm -hmm. could do this in six months, actually. Less. Less. You could do this in a month. Yeah, and now there's something else you can do to help people get better. Right. And so, but what's really interesting about it is it's, I mean, because it also addresses underlying um, anxiety, 
trauma in a nonverbal way. It can be used for all stages of recovery. But not only that, um, during 9-11, or after 9-11, People who were working in the South Bronx at the Lincoln Hospital went to Ground Zero, St. Vincent's Hospital, a variety of areas, and started offering ear acupuncture for first responders who were dealing with the devastating stress of what happened. Mm. And many people were actually able to function and sleep better from getting ear acupuncture um, than, you know, than other modalities that were offered at St. Vincent's Hospital. They were doing talk therapy. Nobody wanted to talk. Um, they were offering some massage. They were offering some Reiki, but it was the ear acupuncture that people were gravitating towards the most. And this has been done on street corners in um, New Orleans after 9-11. Um, it's been offered in fire stations in New York City. It's been offered in fire stations in New Orleans. I mean, like, and here we, in New Hampshire, we have the safe station program. It's happening at a fire station. So I see, once again, acupuncture and fire stations could come together. But I don't know if anybody wants that. That's just in my idea. I'm like, this just makes sense. Well, well you, you've got EMTs this working is true. there. You've got paramedics. Right. Yeah. I've talked to Chris stations. Blevins about this. She, right. And she's really interested, and she completed her EMT training. I've talked to a few other um, retired um, EMTs who are really interested so I don't know. I'm hoping I just keep talking to people. They come to the clinic. I tell them about it. You know, they're interested. I give them the information. I think it's just a matter of time. So once they hear about it, mm -hmm. once they understand what you're saying, and, right. and the fact that the track record goes back well into the 70s, mm -hmm. and it's unfailingly demonstrated improvements mm -hmm. on the part of those that receive it, um, why you know, we have the safe station program I, I would think emts would be lining up if they knew yeah if they knew i know but again i feel like i'm this like one woman movement and i you know wonder am i crazy do people think i'm crazy let them yeah okay let them let them history is rarely made by by people that keep their mouth shut and that's true. And state, You're right. State of your or are well behaved. Well there are behaved. many people on the board of acupuncture licensing who wish I would behave better. And I'm like thinking, gee, people are dying. People like kids are losing their parents. Parents are losing their children. But oh, let's talk about how I need to behave better. Preach. Yeah. Exactly. Preach, sister. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, you know, we're making light. We're making yeah. light. But the yeah. fact is, this is yeah. a big deal, folks. And, and there's, there's mm -hmm. very few families, I think, out there that can say honestly mm -hmm. that they haven't somehow been personally touched right. by this tragedy. The fact that these these poisons are on the street and that mm -hmm. sometimes people are turning to them just because they have developed an addiction, whether it's mm -hmm. through pharmaceuticals mm -hmm. or through recreational use, whatever. Right, exactly. But it's happening mm -hmm. and good people are succumbing to it mm -hmm. and it's terribly seductive. Mm -hmm. And, you know, everyone thinks it's not going to happen to me. Right. But, you know, they find themselves in the situation where their life has fallen apart because mm -hmm. their priorities shifted as a result of this, right. of this chemical. Yeah. And uh, getting off of it, if we can do things that that are constructive, non-invasive, why would we not explore that? Right, so, exactly. I mean, you know, I sound like a commercial for what you're going for here, but yeah. I'm, I'm sold. And I like to think of myself as a reasonable person who, who tries to weigh the facts. And I'm finding it difficult, other than the turf war right. explanation, to understand why there's as much pushback from the establishment as there is. Again, that's the real only establishment pushback that's overt. But again, in order for it to work, there has to be buy-in from the top in a lot of different treatment programs. Right. And so I meet people all the time who run programs and they say that they're interested. And then who knows, you know, I'm not necessarily seeing them, you know, expressing interest in bringing in Laura Cooley, who's a trainer in New Hampshire to train their staff. It's because they probably already have a million things on their plate. Um, I've met a number of people who work for Manchester Mental Health are all interested, but they're all talking to the people who make the ultimate decisions at the top level, and they're still kind of weighing it and thinking it out, and if it's something that they want to invest in. And there's an initial investment in getting your staff trained. It's about sure. 500 bucks a person, but it can be negotiated if it's a whole group of people or a whole program of people. Right. But once someone's trained in ear acupuncture, they're trained. The, you know... Acupuncture needles are cheap, cotton balls are cheap, and sharps containers are relatively cheap. Like once you've got it, you've made that initial investment, then the rest of the supplies are just, you know, you know we're talking about a few cents per needle. Yeah, and that newly trained person with a little right. bit of experience under their belt can probably further certify in order to be a trainer themselves. Exactly. Right? Actually, there are programs that have their own in-house trainers. 
is this should go exponential. Right. I mean, the whole goal <laughs> of the National Acupuncture Detoxification Association, from what I've learned over the last two years, is that they were trying to train themselves out of existence, but they've been around since the 1980s because, again, this is never caught on the way that any one of us would have thought that it would have. You know, during the 1980s, the 1990s, when many of these early pioneers of ear acupuncture for substance misuse were doing their work, there weren't like any, like there wasn't a local NA, um, NPR affiliate that was showing up to interview them. It's taken wow. it this long and for the epidemic to be this proportional or maybe this white for the media and legislators to pay attention. I think that's a reasonable suggestion. And I, 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 it's, I, I hate to have to wrap my head around the possibility that what you just said mm -hmm. in its entirety is, is it, a fact, mm -hmm. but you yeah, know, mm -hmm. Circumstances do seem to support that. Yeah, I mean, I've talked to Willard and Brenda Lett. They run shows here at this radio, at this TV station. They are members of the NAACP. You know, they are pointing out what's glaringly obvious is, you know, this, there's always been a mental health epidemic. There's always been a substance misuse epidemic. It's just that now that it's affecting upper middle class white people, people are starting to pay attention when this has been something that's been used all along. Wow, so you think the socioeconomic component just could could be the tipping point mm -hmm. potentially for the broad-based application okay. of this. And I think about that all the time, which, which is why I'm often telling people, look, we wouldn't have this, this treatment if it weren't for the Black Panther Party. I feel like that is so central and I want everyone to know that as, you know. Sure, yeah. I mean, it's not like we're necessarily saying that we should all be yeah. Black Panthers. <laughs> yeah, well, or, that, or that we're four, four square in favor of the entire platform or, or right. agenda mm -hmm. of, of the Black Panthers or their spokespersons. Mm -hmm. Nobody's saying that necessarily. What they are saying is that mm -hmm. this is a group of people who were looking after their mm -hmm. own and they neighborhoods. Made, yes, and they made great contributions families. to public health. They were the pioneers of free breakfast and school lunch programs before the government actually caught on and started doing that also. That all happened because of the Black Panther that's Party. That's fascinating. That would make yeah. a whole other show. Yeah, if that's a whole other show. Which is, the, that's really interesting <laughs> to look into. And it was actually Dr. Matulu Shakori founded one of the first acupuncture schools in the country in Harlem. He's the stepfather of the late rapper Tupac Shakur. No way. Yes. <laughs> wow. See, look at that. Concentric circles. Yeah. Uh, so all... All respect to Tupac, right? Um, okay, so there's some folks out there that are sold on the value of mm -hmm. this. They're in the medical uh, mm -hmm. health profession, or they mm -hmm. know someone who is. Right. What next? What do they do? You know, um, I would say they should contact. They should go to the website for the National Acupuncture Detoxification Association. So www.acudetox.com. Okay. So and do they have a fancy acronym or something? Or? Nada. <laughs> Nada. <laughs> Nada. Okay. It's called Nada. <laughs> okay. Like it's nothing. It's just needles N and stillness. N A D A. Which yeah, the, the NADA protocol. Spanish, course, exactly. A little odd. Right. But maybe the correlation is if you if you practice this, your pain will go away. Nothing. Yeah. How's that? Right. Okay. So it's it's triple W N A D A. It's www.acudetox.com. Acudetox.com. That's the website for pencil. NADA. <laughs> Write that down. Mm -hmm. Look into it. Um, yeah. This has got to reach critical mass. Mm -hmm. That's how movements catch on. Mm -hmm. That's how changes, positive changes, get made in healthcare. Always has been. Mm -hmm. There's a point at which the demand is such that those that are trying to keep things status quo realize that they're either losing business. Right. Oftentimes, it's all about follow the money. Oh, look, we can harness a new market. Acupuncturists are hardly making any money to begin with. Sure. Right. Sure. Um, but getting this skill legally in the hands of those that are on the front lines yeah. is really what your, your, your mission is all about. Am I right? Yeah, okay. exactly. And there's a lot of people on the front lines. Um, folks, a lot of you out there, are, you know, you're facing an overwhelming influx of, of need and uh, of patients that are suffering from these issues. And, and to ignore this additional tool in your toolbox would be a shame. Um, truly would be a shame. It doesn't mean you have to run off and become an acupuncturist full-time. Mm -hmm. It just means that this is a skill. Think of yourself as a MASH unit, and uh, you need to have all the tools available to you to, to do your jobs. See, I'm making the, I'm, now I'm doing a commercial yeah. for you. Right. 
because but of, I see this I'm as a, a great way to get people interested in acupuncture in general if someone can competently use five points in the year to help somebody with their anxiety or keep them from relapsing or help someone sleep better at night they might be more interested to to get acupuncture from a licensed acupuncturist okay we should be working in partnership like I want to work with people who are learning mm -hmm. you know the protocol practicing it you know in their jobs and I'm around if they have any questions and in a, again there should be some kind of a partnership when people get out of a recovery program they are going to need referrals to where they can continue to get affordable acupuncture yeah sounds right uh are you comfortable serving as a public point person um an information dispensary for this kind of thing or i'm are, i've been doing that i mean and if i don't know something i have people that i can i can fact check with so you're okay putting uh, some contact information out on the air at this time so people yeah can why not yeah but new hampshire residents who are in medical health care or just wish to step up mm -hmm. and get involved want to find someone right here locally in the state of right. New Hampshire what do they do um, you, you know what I've given out my cell number on on Manchester community television before okay. so if you, do you have a website I, you know well I would just that's why I tell people to go to the the NADA website okay because it's the national website but ultimately what they'll what will happen is they'll actually link people back to Laura Cooley who is the not a trainer in New Hampshire. We need to consider looking into setting up a, sp a speaking platform for Ms. Cooley and uh, as well as some of these other fellows that you've mentioned. Yeah. To come to New Hampshire and speak to medical practitioners right. who are dealing with the opiate crisis right. so that they can better understand it. A two hour speech right. can go a long way. I mean, fortunately, she's in Orford, New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. And while I'm here in Manchester, you know, just showing up at Hope and talking to whoever will listen to me. Um, Laura is on the more northwestern part of the state okay. um, on a regular basis. She does most of her work in Vermont, but um, when she has a chance, she's been working with Ladex on the western part of the state. She'll be doing a training in Lebanon, think later on in April, but another training in April will happen out of Revive in Nashua. And you heard it here. So you've got at least two extremely well-versed mm -hmm. professional acupuncturists, two women who are who are aware of how this can change uh, change a community's complexion in terms of treatment. So that's two resources. How about an email address? You know what? If people run, want to reach me, the best thing to do is you can find me at the Manchester Acupuncture Studio, mm -hmm. um, Elizabeth at ManchesterAcupuncturestudio.org, or and you can call the clinic at 603-669-0808 and leave a message for me there. That way I don't have to give out my cell number on the air. Yeah, yeah I just want to <laughs> <laughs> provide you with that option. Uh, we only have a couple of minutes left, but we do have an incoming call. We're going to do it quick. Oh, they hung Apparently, on. that's uh, no. all gone. Bye, bye. Yeah, um, bye. My mistake. Okay, we're gonna say goodbye. The voice of God has advised <laughs> us. We got to say goodbye. So, thanks for joining us, Elizabeth Ropp. It's been a pleasure and an honor. Yeah, as, thanks as it for always the, is. Oh, thank you. And uh, we thank you for joining us. We'll see you next week. Yeah.